My name is Ryan Lewis, and welcome to another episode of Training Data, the world's most rich and compelling data science podcast. And I've really been looking forward to today's pod because we'll be talking, we'll be taking a step back from our normal discourse to look a little more broadly at the implications of deploying AI models uh, to connected embedded devices. And it's just for example, for people that may be new to this topic, consider all the onboard analytics necessary for an autonomous uh, car to operate, just in something simple that already exists in the market today, like lane assist. These offerings present a completely new attack surface for malicious actors in a myriad of industries ranging from automotive to the space industry. And yet market trends are clearly moving towards uh, increasing connectivity and expanding uh, edge analytics for a majority of devices that we use in our daily lives. What can organizations do to increase cybersecurity of their embedded systems while these market dynamics unfold? To help us unpack this uh, challenge and formulate an answer to the question, we're fortunate to be joined by Dr. An Sway, the founder and CEO of Red Balloon Security, as well as Joseph Pantoga, a research scientist at Red Balloon. Thanks for coming, guys. Welcome to DC. Uh, thanks for having us. Yeah, great to be here. Also, a warm welcome uh, to Coley Lewis, who's returning to Training Data uh, after debuting on his fifth pod. Uh, for those of you who haven't listened to that, he is uh, the director of IC support at Incutel and has worked closely with Ong, Joseph, and Red Balloon team since uh, Incutel's initial investment back in 2017. It's good to have you back. Thank you, Ryan. I'm glad to be back. I'm also a warm welcome to our guest, uh, Ong and Joseph. All right, guys. So it's red pill, blue pill time. Let's see how far the rabbit hole goes. Remember, we're just offering truth here. All right. So you guys were uh, founded uh, back in, in 2011 in New York City. Since then, you've raised over $21 million. You've received numerous awards, and you've built deep customer relationships with both public and private sector organizations. And you've expanded your market offerings with your core pro uh, product, Symbiote, to numerous verticals. Just how do you get started? Uh, the motivation was poverty. Uh, so I'd started, uh, well, so before I went to grad school at Columbia, and I did my PhD at Columbia University focusing on uh, technologies around embedded security. Um, before I did that, I worked in finance, and I was building uh, all of these uh, high-frequency trading co-location networks all over the world because, uh, you know, we wanted to beat the, cheat the speed of light. Um, and, uh, you know, at that point, you know, I really got to look inside literally the money machine that makes the world go, right? So, you know, what's inside? It, it was all Cisco equipment, you know, Cisco switches and Cisco routers, but no Cisco firewalls because um, do you know what a serialization delay on a gigabit Ethernet, like, inter like network is? No. It's like a millisecond. That's crazy. You can't have that. No. Uh, so, you know, the, the delay that a firewall would add would be just unacceptable to high frequency trading. So, you know, I, I looked at like these, the actual pipe, uh, the plumbing of the, the entire finance machine. And, uh, you know, these are not all that secure, right? So these are just, you know, the embedded devices with software running on, you know, these routers and switches that are probably, you know, 10, 15 years old. So I bought a few of these, uh, went home and proved to myself that, yes, you can certainly hack these routers and switches just like any other computer. And, um, you know, I proved two things to me. One, uh, I can randomly change the latency of packets that I didn't like with some probability, right? So this isn't just, uh, you know, like drop a packet here and there because that'd be too obvious. But, um, you know, what if we added like a two millisecond latency here and there because it's no longer, right, in the cam table, right? All of a sudden it has to do an ARP. And then, you know, that packet will be a little slower, right? And that, what that probably translates to is a significant business in terms of making money in a pretty covert way. And then the second thing I proved to myself is, you know, once you hack one of these things, you can physically destroy them uh, just through code execution, right? You can make it so that uh, effectively you break it to the point where you need to physically desolder a chip, right, in order to make that device come back to life. And then the question is, okay, if this is true, uh, you know, if, if somebody really wanted to destroy the finance machine, they certainly can. Uh, and, you know, there's no way if somebody did that, there's no way the world can reconstitute the financial machine. Uh, we literally don't have enough spare Cisco routers to rebuild this stuff within 72 hours. And, and even if we did, you know, you're, you're just, you're, this is too complicated of a problem to come back from. So then, you know, I thought, well, two possibilities here, right? Either I'm literally the first human being who's ever thought about this, and this is not an issue, right? Because, I would, you know, the stock market trades every day and everything seems fine. It's either that or the people who have exploited these networks 
uh, they operate at a high level of proficiency and they don't crash things yeah. that they don't mean to. And this is probably happening, but we don't have the technology to detect that this is happening to us, right? Because, you know, how do you look inside something like a Cisco router to figure out if it's writing the code that it's supposed to be writing, right? Because yeah. um, everything about these embedded devices is you have to trust, uh, you know, the vendor as basically God, right? Like you don't touch what's inside, you can't uh, change what's inside, you turn the button on, you configure it and you use it, right? Like you love it, you obey it, like that's that's what it is. So, you know, and that question kind of uh, rattled in my head for, for a few months and I said, okay, you know what, I'm gonna go back to grad school and I'm gonna go build a technology that allows us to look inside the things like Cisco routers and Cisco switches uh, to see if, you know, the, you know, if basically it, Symbiote started out as a rootkit detector for Cisco things. And, yeah. you know, went to Columbia or right, started working on this thing. And a few months into it, you know, we created the first prototype version of Symbiote. Uh, and, you know, we said, this is awesome. You know, we built this thing that detects rootkits inside Cisco iOS, which to us was a mystery operating system that, you know, had no documentation. We've never seen any source code. It's all yeah. proprietary. And then it took like an hour for us to say, oh, wait, take a step back. You know, we didn't just build Symbiote for this one mystery operating system. We built it for pretty much every operating system because we didn't understand what Cisco iOS yeah. was at all. So if you, this works on iOS, it would work on other operating systems, systems that we understand and the ones we don't understand. So, you know, that's how the idea of Symbiote ca came to be. And then the vision uh, back then and still is the vision today is get this technology into all of the embedded devices that run the world that really matters, right? And so that way we can prevent these attacks from uh, happening in the first place, but we can certainly detect, you know, these persistent implants uh, and, and you know, detect people and, you know, things that go after the embedded devices that literally run, you know, every aspect of our modern existence. If Michael Lewis does a follow on to Flash Boys, <laughs> there should be a whole chapter on cybersecurity and you guys should be featured in that. I didn't remember anyone talking about it. I okay. agree, we should, we should. Awesome. <laughs> Yeah, I hit him up. Yeah. But I don't think oh, I can and say the other, it better yeah. myself. And the yeah. other part of the story was um, you know, I my third year as a grad student, I burned through all of my savings from from you know working at the hedge fund and I, I felt the, the sweet sting of poverty. <laughs> and I said, Man, I need to go make some money and maybe start a business. Yeah. And you know, I put those two things together and um Rebeloon. So in addition to partnering with Inkutel on your most recent capital raise, you have also worked with other US government agencies. Do you view security for embedded systems as a national security problem? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Ong just brought up a, a very good example, and mm -hmm. obviously there are numerous other examples that have, you know, are cropping up in the news every day now. Uh, but like one thing that that hasn't cropped up that I think is a, another example of how this affects national security that's not often talked about. Is think about something like agriculture. I know you're a map guy. Uh, <laughs> but but think about all the embedded systems in, in tractors, right? And think about how they're connected and how there's so much data about uh, crop yields and, and how these, these crops are being farmed. And think about the implications of if someone were to be able to hack a tractor. And that's a very random example, but, you know, there are millions like that. And these embedded devices aren't everything. So, you know, the, the obvious issues like our financial system and, you know, our military infrastructure, the industrial control systems that get all the attention, that's important. But there are plenty of other things that affect, uh, you know, the national security. Do you see, you know, one of the things, right, that we've been talking a lot about just, just broadly in EQTEL is the implications from both an investment perspective as just well as a tech trend perspective about the deployment of 5G networks. And are, are you seeing maybe some companies start to wake up more about their security standards as they're thinking through the implications of deploying uh, devices in, in a 5G environment? Or is it just much more of, hey, can we get this thing built and we'll worry about everything else on the other side? Oh, I think it's both of those at the same time. You know, and uh, if you look at the, uh, the latest uh, security review by the British on Huawei, yeah, they said uh, everything's fine. <laughs> yeah. Like they looked at it and, uh, the, the, for people who actually didn't read the report here, uh, here here's what the report said okay uh they didn't have enough of a design and implementation and engineering process that was even sufficient for a review to make sure that the source code that was submitted actually is the thing that generated the binary right so they couldn't even start to think about looking at security because um there's so many problems with it so 
but at the same time, you know, we are in this race to get 5G out there as quickly as possible, just like every other piece of technology we've ever seen. It's always, oh, we want this feature. Let's not think about the consequences. You know, the first one to market wins everything, and then screw security, we'll worry about that, like, later, right? So that's why we had the 90s, and that's yeah. why we have the 2000s, <laughs> right? And it's 2019, so, you know, 5G uh, is, it is going to be like that, right? Um, and it is a little disappointing that we don't actually have an American, you know, 5G yeah. provider in the race. So that is one thing to think about. But, um, you know, so we see, you know, like plenty of people around the world is going to start adopting, right, uh, you know, this this type of, you know, like all of this equipment that frankly has never been tested, right, has never been, you know, looked at by the security community. Um, and we're going to put this all over the world and we're going to have hundreds of things all around us at every get, any given point directly connected to this massive high bandwidth, high low latency network. Uh, and this entire network is actually designed to extract as much information about the, us yes. as possible anyway, right? So, you know, what can go wrong there, right? Like, it's going to be fine. Do I have to get rid of my Garmin watch? Uh, does it, does it 5G? No, but, <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, you know, you, that, that is a really interesting thing. So another thing that we're seeing, right, on the, you know, so we can talk about national security, critical infrastructure, weapon systems, but, you know, there's a whole other side of, you know, like commercial IoT things. Now, you know, three years ago, five years ago, right, we, well, every few years, you know, we look at the, the at commercial IoT market, and as security researchers, we kind of have a good giggle, right? We look at the, <laughs> the stupidest, most frivolous embedded thing that connects to the internet, uh, and we say, haha, this has no security, but let's go worry about something else. So, you know, a few years ago, actually, uh, we gave a talk about this uh, a few weekends ago, and a buddy of mine, um, he found this thing. So they, they make a Bluetooth-enabled egg counter. Right? Wait, what? It counts the number of eggs you have. You put the eggs in the thing. Oh, so they're already in the fridge. They're, it's in the okay. fridge. You have okay. to put the egg in the in the thing, okay. and you can use your Bluetooth phone to tell how many eggs you've put in the thing. Uh, it counts them for you. I'm, tra I'm, I'm tracking awesome. so far. I'm, yeah, it, I'm in. <laughs> yeah, it's great. And also another thing that it's we found. It's terrible when you want two eggs, but you only have one. one. Wow. Yeah, and but you don't have to walk to the fridge. You know, like it, it'll text yeah, you. Yeah, because you can now be driving. Yeah. And also, and the know when you need to go to the store. Yeah. I'm right so, there. So the crazy thing is, uh, well, this thing has 14 egg holders. Oh, that's terrible. Which is, you know, I'm, I'm sure there's like a market research person that yeah. really thought about this. That's but anyway. like six hot dogs <laughs> and like eight buns. Yeah. No one understands so, it. Right. So somebody thought more about that than, you know, the security of, of like this egg counter thing, right? But, but then, you know, typically we'd laugh and say, haha, like what's the problem there? Whatever. Like somebody hacks you and they miscount your eggs, whatever. Right. But what we're seeing now is, you know, we have more and more of these embedded devices that actually have uh, privacy and safety implications, right? So if you look at, you know, children's toys, right? You know, if I don't know if you remember, but there was like a smart Barbie that no. connected to the internet uh, that, that downloaded. Sounds terrifying. Yeah, guess what? Somebody hacked it within like a month yeah, that and they had to uh, recall every one of those Barbies <laughs> and we have them. We have one. I found one, but you know, so you have more and more of these toys for, for kids and, and infants and you have these monitors, baby monitors, you have things that control your HVAC system, right? You have things that literally control like your door, right? And your wallet and all, all that stuff, right? So, you know, we're starting to see a point where, you know, it used to be just, haha, this is all fun and games and this is silly and we know there's no security, but who cares? To the point where, you know, we see people who, uh, who you know, want to make the cheapest, fastest, you know, like whatever thing as quickly as possible and sell it on Amazon and then, yeah. you know, get acquired after they sell 100,000 units and then the cash out, right? But what's going to happen is, you know, one, those people might, let's say, you know, you make a smart lock, right? You might be qualified to know how to make the lock, right? But these people are not qualified to make a computer uh, that connects to the internet even remotely securely, right? So, you know, it, we think of IoT as like a smart thing so that if you know how to make the thing or the computer, Right, you get to make a smart thing. That's not actually true. So, like the right way to do this is you have to be able to be qualified to make a computer and that thing in order yeah. to to sell it. We don't have any rules about that, and the investment community certainly does not care too much. Right, we see um, security as basically an externality, um, and you know consumers don't really understand the the risks that they have. Yeah. So, you know, we we see this um, uh, scenario where we have millions of these really crappy, horribly insecure embedded things all over right, our networks. Um, and we're going to, at some point, have to deal with that. And, and to multiply on that, and this was kind of going back to the opening, I know, right, obviously, we focus a lot mainly on open source computer vision work. 
so much of what's happening in that domain now is talking about obviously deploying those models as far as you can to the edge. So in your case, Joseph, with the, the tractor example, right, the tractor needs to be able to function even if it loses connectivity. So it needs to have some sort of onboard analytics to guide itself. Oh, yeah. What can go wrong there? Right? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Further onto that, what you're talking about uh, is most of this is hardware we already know and build or is off the shelf commercially. So much of what's happening in the AI domain is spinning out custom hardware to optimize model performance. And if you're kind of like if you're a guy like me and you're looking at um, how can we increase performance at the edge, you're willing to make trade offs. But at the same time, thinking about how that incorporates into some specialized hardware chip, that is that is a whole nother topic of conversation, which to be honest with you, is not something that, you know, I've really spent a lot of time thinking about. Yeah. But, well, <laughs> so, I mean, if, if you think about software, right, it's, it's never perfect the first time. I mean, of, of any software that's of any size, it's probably never perfect ever. Definitely. Anything, right. Everything we produce. Definitely <laughs> but, but you have bug fixes, right? You have your alpha, you have your beta and, and the thing is with software is it, it's all built right there and, and you send it out into the world and, and hopefully you can update it quickly and, and patch. With hardware, you don't really have that option. The second that they, they build their silicon and they, they make a production and they send it out you know, into these vehicles, that, that can't be replaced. I mean, they can, they can recall the vehicle, yeah. but that's extremely expensive compared to software. So it does create you know, a, a whole set of, of problems you know, when these are eventually discovered, right? Like, what do you, what do you do then? I think, I think it's going to be a big problem. And, you know, I feel like there's got to be, I, I hope at some point there's a children's book about where does your computer chips come from? <laughs> you know, it's like, <laughs> mommy. I, I would buy that book. <laughs> right? Where do they come from? Do they come from a farm? Uh, but, you know, so sure, somebody in the United States might have, you know, developed a piece of, uh, you know, custom hardware, custom ASIC, or, you know, some kind of a CPU, but guess what? We don't have the fab capability in this country to do very right. much trusted foundry. Um, you put that order out there somewhere, probably China, and it comes back in two weeks. And you get a thing that may or may not work, right? It'll probably work. But uh, here's the question, right? Like, well, one, how many other people have that design now? Yep. Two, uh, is like the thing that you designed the only thing that is inside that design, right? So that's a notoriously difficult question to answer. But um, yeah, if we're just starting to just you know make hardware like willy-nilly right like we don't have the resources to do that kind of security audit and it certainly gives you know plenty of people a lot of opportunities to inject you know things like implants and backdoors right um because yeah supply chain security is really difficult so is there and i'm curious um, comment both of you guys made it, it, it's almost as if like there's some inherent like uh um a sunk cost right that goes into as you add more embedded devices, it becomes so hard to perform a recall that it's almost, in some cases, just it's financially un unwise to even try to recall. It's almost just worth a full replacement at, at some point. And that is fine, right, if it is like a connected Barbie, but even uh, something more advanced than that, suddenly that just becomes financially untenable for both the consumer and the, the product provider. So not only that, you know, Especially in in some areas of con uh, the consumer electronics, you know, industry, there I I've, I see situations where not only you know is a hardware a product recall just financially not something. I mean, nobody wants to do a product recall, right? But we see a situation where, uh, you know, if the company or the vendor is forced to do a recall, the only thing they can really do is go out of business, right? So you're you're thinking about you know anything that's Kind of cool, like a tech gadget, right? That is uh, like a doodad that you know they've uh, raised some money and they've sold a few hundred thousand units of, right? Um, you know they don't have the operating you know, capital to basically like do a full recall of every single product and deal with the security uh, consequences. Um, yeah, like a, a lot of these companies are operating very thin margins, so they have very short runway. They're depending on somebody adopt, you know, the thing blowing up and selling like hotcakes on Amazon. So if there is a recall chances are the only thing that's going to happen is that, that company will probably just go out of business, right? And at the end of the day, that means none of these problems will get fixed, right? And that's, that's a really troubling uh, sign that I, I see more and more of these days. I, I think that's exacerbated when you look at, you know, we have a, a legacy pro like hardware problem in general, I think, and across a lot of different industries. You, you buy, say, a uh, industrial automation controller and, and you put it on your network 
and it's running your factory, you can't afford the, you know, 30 minutes, hour, you know, probably, probably a little bit longer than that to take your factory down every five years to do a replacement for something with off to, you know, up-to-date software. Um, that, that, that is a problem that people recognize. And the way they get around it, especially in organizations with really tight requirements, is they waive it. Because, <laughs> you know, I mean, I mean yeah. think about it, right? Yeah. You, you, you can't, you know, financially feasibly do something about this, so you waive it. And you, and you accept that risk. You know, as this happens, you know, across not just, you know, industrial controllers, but, you know, all types of connected things. Um, I, I see this problem growing exponentially. Ooh, and one thing to think about, too, right, is, you know, there's a thing of, you know, m maybe people don't want to do anything about it because it is expensive. And the other question is, okay, if they even if they wanted to do the right thing, right, what can they do to actually significantly improve the first security of their firmware? And and here's where I plug Red Balloon Security, right? Because um, wait for it. Yeah. Go right. Ahead. So, I mean, just like everything else, you know, let's say a company who makes industrial controllers. Uh, you know, we we expect them to know how industrial automation works and how to create, you know, computers that work in real time in, you know, like extreme conditions. But we shouldn't expect that company to be also a world class security yeah. firm. Right. Like there's no reason for us to really expect that. Uh, and what really should happen uh, is that a embedded security company should be able to come in and offer technology that only focuses on securing embedded things. Uh, to help these people, uh, these customers, you know, improve the security of these things. So, um, you know, when I started my PhD work at Columbia, uh, there basically was not, nothing like that. And, you know, there are a few, you know, technical reasons, but a lot of it is also just the business model around embedded things, right? So if you buy, let's say, that industrial controller, you're not even supposed to look inside the, the binary to figure out what kind of code is running in there. You absolutely have no way of changing anything that runs on that device. I mean, everything is signed and it's all locked down. And this is the same for, you know, cars, for tractors, for every type of, you know, basically every every kind of commercial embedded device. So, you know, a major contribution that we we did both on the academic side and also, you know, with Symbiote as a product is that we actually created a technology that can go into the firmware of all these devices and without getting access to, you know, uh, their source code without without having to do any kind of rewrite. Right, do something that actually improves the security of this firmware. So, and and to be able to automate it. So the same symbio that runs inside, let's say, an HP printer, uh, literally can run inside, let's say, you know, a tractor uh, or a Cisco router. Um, and that is the, you know, I think that is the technical innovation that really is going to allow um, the endpoint security business to exist for embedded devices. That's awesome. And on that, on that point, uh, now that we're sufficiently scared, but perhaps a little hopeful. I want to take a quick break uh, just to talk about some of the things we're up to in the lab, and then we'll come on back and dive into the details. Okay, let's assume that the hardware and the software that we're working in is actually secure and talking about how we'd use it for geospatial applications. Uh, the Cosmic team will be at Phosphor G International, which is going to be in Romania, in Bucharest, Romania this year. And specifically, we'll be talking about actually three different tracks. So one will be uh, a colleague of, of mine, Jake Schirmeyer, will be talking about comet time series, looking at satellite imagery over uh, and extracting key trends over uh, a series of time, uh, time series data uh, from a variety of different satellites. Uh, Nick Weir will be talking about Cosmic's new open source repository uh, to quickly spin up models for machine learning using some of uh, our open source data that's called Solaris. And then last but not least, uh, yours truly and the SpaceNet partners. Uh, we'll be talking about SpaceNet and our upcoming uh, competition called SpaceNet 5, focused on road networks and routing and timing from a single satellite image, which will be launching in early September. Uh, we'll be posting more information on our website and through social media, and hope to see you in your Romania. All right, now back to the show. We are back with Ang and Joseph from Red Balloon Security, and we were just at the break, we were just talking about what an embedded security company like Red Balloon can do. Right. And I think that's one of the things now that we've kind of clearly identified the problem, it's kind of worth digging into, you know, how do we go about unpacking this? You know, I think one of the areas we've already talked about uh, from a verticals perspective is the automotive sector. Uh, you've done a lot of things in that domain. Uh, just walk us through kind of like what both Symbiote can do and also some of the other things you've already done. I, I know I've just I was poking around some of your site and saw sort of the, the sandbox that you guys also created, which was pretty cool. Yeah. So by the way, you know, for uh, for those listening, 
if you go to www.redballoonsecurity.com, it'll tell you basically nothing. And, you know, <laughs> it has all the papers uh, that we've written and things like that. But um, you got know, a great store. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it, well, there is a web store. We'll talk about that later. But, um, you know, we're not one of these companies that puts out a million, you know, hopes and dreams, white papers. Um, but, you know, for the people who uh, are in the community that cares about, you know, embedded security for the verticals that we, we operate in, you know, we are fairly well known. And, you know, here's what we can do, right? So the at the heart of it, what Symbiote does is it acts as a host-based defense system that looks inside the, the firmware, or looks inside the embedded device as the firmware is running from inside the device. So, you know, this might sound obvious when I say it, but it's a lot better to do, do something that's security related when you can see inside the device for, uh, instead of outside the device. So, you know, uh, I know we're talking ML and, you know, big data and things like that. So, you know, and I, I come from the Columbia Intrusion Detection Systems Lab where, you know, that lab has done a lot of very innovative, you know, like very innovative, uh, you know, things around uh, anomaly-based detection, uh, you know, behavior-based network intrusion detection. But the problem is at the end of the day, you know, if you're only looking at the traffic coming in and out of a, a computer, right, you fundamentally do not have as much context about what's going on inside that computer as if you were literally operating inside. This is why, you know, a your typical antivirus gets installed on the computer and not on your Ethernet card, yeah. right? Because you get to see, you know, not just the, the traffic that looks quote unquote weird, but, you know, if there's an actual corruption or an actual persistent implant or something actually going wrong inside that, that computer. So this symbiote allows you to do exactly that but for all of these embedded devices with unknown operating systems and proprietary environments, you know, it is much easier to build, let's say, antivirus, uh, you know, for Windows, right? And, you know, for 15 years, right, the majority of the cybersecurity industry was in endpoint security for antivirus for, for Windows. Um, so if you understand that operating system, you can build something that secures that one OS. But, you know, and this is a fun game, right? Look around you. Look at a thing that has a, a light or a, a on switch. Chances are there's a computer inside that runs probably millions, if not tens of millions of, of lines of code. Um, try to guess what operating system runs inside that thing, right? So, you know, like, um, well, let's see. I'm gonna... This is actually a low tech room, uh, aside from all <laughs> the audio equipment. But, you know, let's, let's say uh, like a, a Crestron, right? Like, a, you yeah. know, like a thing in the conference room or your IP phone. Right, like your Cisco IP phone or Avaya. I mean, like go and wonder, like, hmm, I wonder what code runs in there. And you know, right. the vendors never tell you, right? And you're never going to get the source code to those devices. So Symbiote allows us to uh, look inside, you know, the execution environment of every one of these pr proprietary black box devices uh, in an automated way. So uh, that's what we can do. You know, what does that translate to? Uh, so, for example, persistent implants, rootkits, right? So things that cause physical destruction any kind of memory corruption at all uh, or control flow corruption inside any of these embedded devices that runs a mystery operating system, uh, Symbiote can detect within milliseconds. And not only that, we report the forensic information about exactly how the attack happened, the memory state as the attack is happening. Uh, so basically, you know, you, you're getting actually more security capabilities that you would find than, uh, than your, your typical Windows laptop, right? retrofit it automatically into an embedded device that probably runs a 50 megahertz processor, right, with code that was written probably 15 years ago. How um, much how much tuning do you have to do, though, for, like, industry-specific uh, cases? So, like, I, I just think about, like, so much of what we deal with in, in space or aerospace is all about, you know, your, your swap. Like, what are your, what's your trade-off so you can minimize uh, and optimize what you have on, on whatever the vehicle may be? And that, that kind of leads you to like a lot of one-off uh, solutions that are developed for that specific problem. Does that impact uh, Symbiote and how you guys attack the problem? Yeah, that's a that's an excellent question. I refer you to like page seventeen of my dissertation. Please go read my <laughs> dissertation. I think like maybe a dozen people in the world have read it. But um, well, don't worry. We'll, we'll put the link <laughs> yeah, out. Yeah, so don't worry. Go. We'll Just, put that uh, archive paper out there. Uh, but um, you know that that's exactly well. That's one of the major, the most difficult problems that Symbiote solved, right? And it was you know starting from the beginning, we recognized that you know if you had to build a a specific you know solution for every type of embedded device that you want to secure. Right. That's first of all not humanly tenable unless you have a massive army 
of people like literally rewriting you know antivirus over and over again yeah. and two you know it's not I think, secure i think we call those interns <laughs> well no they they solder okay and desolder but and, and also you know if you're re implementing the thing from scratch you can't actually make any guarantees about the equivalence of the security posture of a versus b right so yeah. that's actually not even secure and thirdly you know like that's not a business model right you can't just you know like reinvent the security uh, technology for you know like you know, a thing that sells like, you know, even a million units a year, right? Because that's not going to sustain uh, the effort that's required. So the major technical challenge that Symbiot solved was how do we abstract away all of these, you know, differences and nuances and one-offs and quirks of, of these embedded devices? So how do we make a thing that unifies the ability uh, for us to put the same um, security algorithm in every single thing, right? Regardless of what operating system and what software they run. Um, so, you know, the trick is, um, you have to write this once for each processor type. So, you know, ISAs, right? So, you know, MIPS, ARM, x86, yeah. but, you know, the world doesn't have an infinite number of these, uh, like, processors unless, you know, the, um, the ML community <laughs> gets their way, right? In which case that might be a problem. But, you know, for the most part, right, like ARM, MIPS, PowerPC, x86, x64, right? Once you have this implemented, you cover a large portion of the world's embedded devices. And then once we implement it for one processor type, uh, it'll work on anything that runs on that processor. So that was uh, our solution to solve that problem. So last year, guys, you released the automotive exploitation <laughs> sandbox for automotive OEMs and, and their suppliers. What was the the motivation for building and releasing this, Joseph? Yeah. So, you know, I think, and, and you know, we're talking about the automotive industry because I know it applies to perhaps some of your other podcasts you've done. But I think this holds across a number of, of different industries and in that uh, you need, I, I, you know, coming from a, a security person, you know, we kind of innately appreciate the security issues I think that these, these people have. But, you know, I think a, a big, big part of it was ensuring that the information is out there in an approachable way for, you know, experts in engineering these systems to, uh, you know, learn a little bit about the security implications of what they're designing. And it, and it's funny we did release that publicly, and I think you can you can go to it today. Maybe the the link will will pop up beneath the podcast. But uh, well, don't worry, we'll put. I was I was, I was poking around. <laughs> with I, I think we're like we're, and subscribe. We're forcing yeah. we're forcing Ryan to uh, <laughs> find links to, to to put there. But you know when we put that out at at the SCAR Automotive Security Conference a few years ago, we were really surprised by the feedback we received from not just automotive companies, but some of the the tangential organizations that deal in the automotive space or or others, where they wanted us to to do something similar for for them. That's cool. And and show their engineers the implications of, of what they're building and 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 you know how they can be exploited somewhat trivially, you know, by by trivial mistakes. So it's a it's an easy set of challenges. It's not meant to challenge the security expert. But you know, I think it I think it does give a good, you know, high level view to to engineers who who build these systems. So let's take a step back to, um, you know, what the what the automotive exploitation sandbox is, is we took a very typical piece of hardware that we see used in, you know, automotive infotainment systems uh, and gateways and things like that. Um, you know, so basically this is an IMAX processor. It's called the Saberlight board. But, you know, this is a demo board used by a lot of the hardware designers in automotive, right, to make these things. And then we took, on top of that, we added the most typical automotive software stack that we we found. So, you know, QNX is in a lot of these things. So basically this is a, a like an open box that you can you can mess with that shows, you know, anybody who wants to quote unquote learn about automotive security, what it means to actually remotely exploit the software stack and the hardware stack that's very typical in cars. And one of my big things is um, you know, so we operate in automotive and industrial control, right? And the, you, it, there's some other companies out there that would say, well, we are an automotive security company, yeah. right? And I don't know, like we're an industrial control security company. And that sounds really good because it sounds like they have expertise. Uh, my thing is we're not an automotive or industrial control security company. We are an embedded security company. And what embedded security is, it's just software and hardware security issues with unique embedded constraints, right? For whatever vertical. And also think about this, right? Most... Embedded devices in most of these verticals, at the end of the day, it is an embedded computer that controls a thing that spins a thing in a circle, right? Cars spin wheels, 
in, like you know, like industrial control things like spin motors, right? Building control systems also spin motors. Uh, power plants spin, you know, other things in wheels, right? Satellites I, move gyros. Yeah, you there know, you I, I challenge you to find a computer that like controls a thing that moves in a triangle, right? <laughs> because the triangle shape is a thing done by like worm gears that goes in a circle. So, you know, at the end of the day, right, there, there's a lot of commonalities um, in all of these different verticals and all the security um, problems that they have. And when you talk to the automotive community, you know, they, they think that they have a unique automotive security problem because all of a sudden, you know, these are people who are used to engineering cars talking about security. So the point that we were trying to prove was that, you know, remotely exploiting, you know, this automotive component, quote unquote, is really just like remotely exploiting any other computer over the internet, right? So some things are different, you know, this runs a different type of processor, um, but the principles are the same, right? Get code execution, uh, remote code execution, privilege isolation on the on the device, and then you can do all sorts of crazy things by messing around with the hardware in the kernel. So, you know, we put this uh, kind of a walkthrough tour together, and it's designed for, you know, like a, any engineer to take maybe like half an hour, right, to go from like command injection to privilege escalation to kernel memory modification. Uh, and hopefully it does show people that yeah. there's not that much mystery in automotive security, right? It's just that this computer controls a wheel about, you know, like this big, right? Like, you know, instead of something that's like a, a few inches or whatever. Um, and also for the listeners, there is a challenge. This is an unofficial official challenge. So <laughs> we have uh, about a dozen of these uh, pieces of hardware um, you know, on remote power. So I don't believe in like emulation. You know, I think if you're doing this, like you have to do it on hardware. Yeah. That's part of the magic. So, you know, we have um, a dozen of these things reboot on, I think like half an hour or 45 minute cycles, right? So everything boots up the network. There's no persistent storage. So that way, you know, if you crash the thing, it'll boot and come back up. But if you get your name in the bootloader, right? You get persistence in the bootloader, uh, you message the email that you find in the bootloader, and we will mail you an excellent bottle of Japanese whiskey. Whoa. <laughs> yeah. So well, only I may, one I may try to participate. I'm not going to win, but I want to participate because uh, of the prize. So two people have won in the last year and a half. It's Hibiki or Yamazaki. I, yeah. either, either way, right. that, that's, then, that's, worth, that's worthy enough a prize. And then the, the winner was in Canada, and he was like, I only drink bourbon. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> so we called it Operation Bourbon. <laughs> and it was very difficult to mail whiskey into Canada. Like, they don't allow it. So we had to. It was it was the thing. But if you get your name in the blue loader, you'll see the email. Uh, and then we will mail you a bottle of yeah, probably like Hakushu or something, you know? Well, I need, uh, <laughs> Joseph, I need the link for that. Another link to put up. We'll we'll get you that. Okay. And staying on this topic, you know, you mentioned on different things that have been going on with the sandbox and the feedback you've been getting. How do you see this offering changing as we see more and more cars become semi-autonomous to autonomous? Um, I mean, you guys are starting to dive into that. I mean, just kind of a, a preview. Like, I imagine your perspective of this has changed quite a bit since a year a year ago, two years ago. What do you see this evolving to? To the point where I mean, are we going to have a cyber company that focuses solely on all these autonomous vehicles or what, what do you well, think is going you know, on here? So going back to something that Joseph said before, right? You know, there's a lot of talk on, you know, fully autonomous, like level three, level four, level five autonomy. Um, and that's nice. That's exciting because that's cool. Like who doesn't love a car that drives you around? Um, but, you know, there aren't that many of those on the street right now, right? So if you had to guess what the, lar the world's largest autonomous fleets of vehicles are on this planet. What do you think it is? Uh, robots at Amazon factory. And we kind of already mentioned it. Uh, Agricultural uh, equipment. Yeah. Tractors, oh, uh, right? So, you know, these things are, you know, like you can have a combine followed by like a thing that, I don't know what you call the thing that the combine put. So I, they, they like platoon essentially? Yeah. So they, uh, you know, so they have um, their own version of terrestrial GPS, right? Uh, like a whole fleet of things can coordinate and drive right alongside each other and they get something it. like sub inch repeatability right on a field right so this is all you, you can plot out your harvest path from uh, like a web interface and this thing basically drives itself right so in, i think in the us there's a law that says an operator has to be in the lead you know combine thing but really all that is is that person holding it down a button right so all these things are basically yeah. autonomous already so you know uh we already have a, a very large security problem with autonomous vehicles because first of all you know one we like to play this uh, game and it always ends up being sad, right? Like what happens if, you know, somebody hacks a tractor, right? So the thing that I've wanted to do, and I think we'll still do it, is um, because of the scale of the fields, right? You can make a crop circle 
that's visible from space. <laughs> that's visible from space, right? And you know, like the not so funny the implication of that is, you know, what if what if somebody disrupts like our soybean supply at yeah. harvest time, right? By let's say ten percent, right? I'm sure there's a movie where like somebody corners the soybean market, but in terms of implications, right? Like that will have global financial it implications, would. and all it is is somebody, you know, changing like the firmware update. For example, updating the firmware for like the terrestrial GPS uh, stations that are operating in this country. And there's only like 10,000 of them and they're all connected to one server. So it's not really that far-fetched, right? To take down like our nation's like ability to produce food. Well, on that note, <laughs> uh, but I will say this, I, I, all right, Joseph, I know you guys got to get going, but you know, there's actually a lot of things that are coming up for you guys just in the next couple of months. So, so what, what's going on and, and what should everyone listening uh, be aware of? Man, so we got a, a lot of stuff. Um, well, uh, we just very recently announced a vulnerability in Cisco's Trust Anchor, uh, which is this FP, FPGA um, exploit that we did that we've been working on for the last few years. So uh, we have talks in Black Hat, uh, DEF CON, and we also have a paper accepted in uh, Usenix's Woot. And on top of that, uh, we're doing a Car Hacking Village in DEF CON. So for people who are going to be out in DEF CON, find us. We're going to be all over the place. Um, we're doing Car Hacking Village. We're doing Industrial Control Village. Uh, we're doing IoT Village. And we're also working with the Air Force uh, in order to create an embedded hacking challenge. That's right. Awesome. And the, the concept of that is uh, it is, um, well, it is a secret fort, right? And, you know, for, for Coley, like, you know where this came from, yes. right? It is an yeah. Air Force secret fort, uh, and it's a shipping container, right? And the shipping container is protected by um, a surveillance camera on the outside and a gun turret, right? And a, a, like a cat card reader, you know, like a, a card reader. And inside uh, the shipping container is going to be more cameras and an ATM, right? And the ATM is going to have some cash. And like Willy Wonka style golden ticket, and the win, the the main prize of this is a, a fully paid internship at Red Balloon Security and a internship paid at AFRL, right? So oh, awesome. you know this is a it's going to be great, and you know we're we're showing people how to do like the pro, the stereotypical like trope in like Vegas heist movies where you know like you run up to right like the security camera and you pull out some doodad yeah. and you loop the video, right? So we're that's part of the challenge. In fact, that's how you qualify. Right for the main event is you have to remotely exploit an IP camera and loop the video footage so you don't get seen right on on the video. That is awesome. Yeah, and then we're gonna have Air, Air Force people like on the premise actually looking at the video feed, right? So the idea isn't to like you know hack a computer. The idea is to fool that person that has a gun, right? That will like operate the turret to shoot you if they see you on video. <laughs> I mean, no one's gonna get really shot, right? But okay, so that's uh, we got a lot of stuff going on. <laughs> Uh, at Vegas, um, and also, in terms of uh, congratulations are in order, right? You guys were put up for a Pony Award. That's right. Thank you. Uh -huh. Yeah, you, um, that's a, it's a huge honor. Um, I think it's enough just to be thought of, uh, you know. So, but yeah, the the Thurgood Cat, the Cisco uh, vulnerability work that we did is uh, nominated for most innovative research. And I think the main purpose or the main thing that has going for us is uh, instead of naming a vulnerability after words, right? We named it after emojis. <laughs> yes uh so it's that's, like the, that's innovative that is it. i mean we're innovative the, and timely yeah. like we're, we're the first people in the world to name a vulnerability after entirely unpronounceable emojis <laughs> on that note uh one last request on my end guys it's been great to have you on gotta let you have a cosmic shirt and the only request right. i'd make is at some point swag uh yeah if I could figure out how to use the the store, oh, we didn't mention the store. Yeah, yeah, uh, you mentioned the, the the shop. You yeah. So we don't really advertise that, but uh, well, you know, okay, fine. There is a red balloon web store where everything's a dollar. Uh, it is on our website somewhere. It is. Uh, I won't I won't say where. Yeah. And uh, one of the items uh, is um, it's this thing called What's You Need, and what you do is you write us a poem in whatever <laughs> format you want, and we all read it and think about it, and we'll mail you back whatever we think you need. Uh, that's a dollar. Uh, and we have tattoos, like temporary tattoos and stickers and, and T-shirts. Um, and wasn't there advice from Ong? Yeah, for that's uh, so like that <laughs> is in stock like once every three months. So I, you know, let's just so you, get, so you guys know, like we don't, you know, like mass produce any of these things. It's all custom. So mm -hmm. I don't have that much advice, right? So it's out of stock for now. But like when I come up with something, 
it'll, well, be, it'll be I'll be up. thinking of a poem in iambic pentameter I'll be practicing it. it I'll be submitting something but uh on Joseph and Coley thanks for coming in this was a lot of fun I really appreciate it and best luck at Black Hat coming up right. thank you thank, thank you, you. For thank you.